So uh, a warm welcome to this um, first, I'm very excited because this is the first in a series of uh, online learning sessions. Uh, so we decided, the board decided this year to focus the attention of EBBF's <coughs> on success and rethinking success. What is the kind of success that would really lead to the kind of uh, world that we're looking for? And I'm particularly excited because this year we're going to start a new project, which is actually a learning uh, project. And uh, we have Vahid. Vahid Masrur has uh, volunteered, put his hand up, to actually wor uh, work with us. So this call is one of the first of, of a number of uh, initiatives we will be taking. The idea is to really gather insights from the broad diversity of BBF members and then see what do we think success is, what the right thing of success on a personal level, on the organizational <coughs> level, and the societal success that we're looking for. So that's what we are starting kicking off today. And I'm just really happy that Rahid will be here and he will be in Lisbon as well. So we'll make sure of that. So that will be a midpoint. And then we, with the idea is to then uh, publish uh, the insights on a number of magazines, studies and so forth to really broadly share our one year long learning. And Arthur Dahl, who best to kick off our year long learning on success. Arthur is the kind of person that you say uh, it's a go-to person for most uh, conversation that we have here. You know, his background is, uh, has been in, uh, is in corals. That's his initial passion and sea life, but he's really broadly a broad expert in the area of uh, environmental issues and climate action. And he's the president of the <coughs> International Environment Forum. We're just very lucky to have him on the board of UVF. Arthur, without further ado, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you all for joining in. It seemed to me that a good place to start for this kind of a dialogue that's going to be going on and on was to ask for a basic question. If we're rethinking success, success for whom? For whom are we wanting to, in what, in what framework do we define success or what would be successful? Uh, what would be our frame of reference? And in our Western individualist society, it's usually me, myself, and I, you know, it's the, it's the the individual success or the corporate success, one company winning out over the others, or national success being the dominant nation in the world, and, and so on, you know. And so the, the set of values within which the question is asked seems to always focus at some, some, I'd say, fragment or some part of the whole. And I just came a week, a week and a half ago, I was at an interesting conference in, in Stockholm of complex systems scientists. It was convened by some American specialists on complex <coughs> systems uh, who basically said, the world is heading for catastrophe, we're going to collapse. What can complex system science say about where we're going and, and you know, what's happening and is there any way to navigate through, through the challenges ahead? One thing that was interesting was that while well, these were scientists, most of them were also open to the spiritual dimension. And I ended up telling a lot of people about the Baha'i faith and the Baha'i approach to things, which seemed to respond to, to some of their questions. But at the same time, it sort of you know, underlined for me how we need that complex systems perspective to look at the question of success. I mean, a wonderful example is the 2008 financial crisis, because economists and investment managers had found you know, very effective ways of measuring the risk of each financial instrument that they were investing in, and so each derivative product and so on, nobody thought about the success of the overall system. And then there were knock-on effects of weaknesses in one place and the whole thing collapsed because nobody had looked at the, con at the success of the whole system it was all little bits and pieces, each one trying to maximize their own success in a particular area and not acknowledging that they were part of a larger whole. So, when we look at the issue of, of rethinking success, that we really have to say, well, what good is success for an individual uh, if the result is everybody else dying off and then you die off as well? I mean, in, in ecology, we have, you know, things like overshoot and collapse, you know, <clears throat> flower beetles and a bunch of flower. You know, they're very successful. They eat more and more flower and reproduce more and more and have more and more offspring. And it's wonderful until suddenly, you know, they've eaten up all the flower and then they all starve to death. <laughs> So short-term success led to long-term failure. Another an example for me that runs to the extreme would be somebody who's 
just jumped off a hundred story building saying, my, the view is so beautiful. I'm really enjoying this. I've never had such a lovely view. Not thinking about the landing when they get down the hundred floors to the ground. And I think very often, you know, that's what's, that's what's wrong with definitions of success today. They're always partial and they're not asking for the, about the behavior of the overall system. So if, from system science, we look at the complex interactions, relations among all the parts of the system. How do you achieve some dynamic balance among all the different parts of the system? Uh, systems have emergent properties. The things that happen from the system level that are beyond what you might predict from any each part of the system, whole new self of properties. And if you look at the Baha'i faith, it's a, it's a systems approach to religion. Unity and diversity is all about elements of systems. Cooperation and reciprocity are systems characteristics. Solidarity, uh, thinking about everybody, everybody, each individual being a trust of the whole. All of these are systems ways of looking at all of humanity and how it fits in the natural world, how it, how it is evolving, where it is going over time. So the Baha'i faith is very much a religion of system science. You know, and, you know, in fact, even goes beyond it and it helps to understand it in new and, and broader ways than most scientists would. So, and I think we have this recent example of COP25 in Madrid that, that Danielle was involved in. Uh, because each country is looking for its self-interest and defending its own interests, uh, it's very difficult to come up with a, a solution satisfactory to the whole because nobody, or very few anyway, are at the diplomatic level, are looking at the common global interest or they're always having to balance that against what will pass at home, what will be politically possible or not possible, or what are the vested interests they're defending if they're very much in bed with the corporate sector and out there to defend the oil companies or, or whatever. Uh, they're, they're not looking at a larger interest, they're looking at only some part of it. And they're measuring the measures of success you know, are in those narrow terms and ignoring what it means you know, for the consequences for the whole. Another dimension of thinking about success in this larger system framework is the time frame. Uh, you know, in businesses, it's the quarterly financial report, you know, or, you know, the annual report, uh, the relatively short time frame, and sort of judge how you're doing relative to the previous quarter or the quarter one year ago and so on. It's a very, very short term measure. How often do people think about the future of the company? And sometimes focus so much on the short term. I mean, Eric Weinhocker, when he analyzed, you know, the economic system from a systems perspective, said, well, look at, you know, companies like Westinghouse, one of the dominant nations at the beginning of the 20th century, doesn't exist anymore. What about Kodak or Pan Am or World Airways? The, you know, there were major corporations that seemed to be among the most important and dominant in, in their fields. And because they didn't innovate, they didn't change, you know, they perhaps were poorly managed or whatever, you know, they suddenly were left behind and have gone extinct like the dinosaurs. And so we really, how do we measure, you know, the time frame for when do you determine whether or not you're successful? Of course, success is not something you achieve and have and then have it forever after. It's a dynamic question of balance. And therefore, it's really so how long have you kept your balance and how long have you continued to progress? And if you look at, say, you know, the Baha'i perspective, you're know, looking at terms of a, of a, a you know, you know, of, you know, a dispensation of a thousand years or a cycle of 500,000 years. So looking at sustainability in that context, are we really laying the foundation for a civilization for the next 500,000 years? Or perhaps we need to, to think of success, you know, maybe we can't think that far in advance, but at least stretch beyond the extremely short term that is the common framework that, that most people use today. And I think another dimension of the Baha'i approach to to rethinking success is really acknowledging that what good is success as an individual if everybody else around you is failing? And therefore, shouldn't success mean you know, collective success? We all need to be seeding together. You know, or may all, and say the company may all be failing together if we aren't able to, to rein in our production of greenhouse gases. And uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen the, the recent figures uh, in, in the oil industry. <coughs> and how the major oil companies are all planning major increases in production over the next decade, <coughs> up to 20 or 30% for certain like Exxon and, and Shell. Uh, and at the same time that on the climate side, it's saying we must get off fossil fuels as, as soon as possible. So there's a complete disjunct between success as defined by major corporate leaders and 
you know, in their own narrow framework of success and what that implies for the rest of the world. And in fact, their own longer future, you know, in terms of you know, the kind of economy that they're supporting. I mean, some investors begin to recognize that maybe they're going to be stranded assets and they'd better to pull out of investment in fossil fuels. Those are the ones that begin to look ahead, but there's still a major part of the system that is sort of caught up in its inertia and is still using its very narrow definition of success to drive ahead, regardless of, of the consequences you know, for everybody else. <clears throat> so really we need to think, how do we look at planetary success? You know, we really say we need to succeed on this planet. We've reached planetary boundaries. We're overshooting many of them in climate change, biodiversity loss, you know, excessive development of, of nitrates and phosphates and other things and fertilizers and upsetting natural systems. And so, you know, those are all things leading us to failure. And we need to say, how do we bring, you know, our impacts back into balance with, with planetary limits? Uh, and where we're, you know, we're producing enormous amounts of pollution and waste, how do we reduce the, those pollutions or plastic waste and things like that? You bring it back down to manageable levels or rethink the systems behind them. So the success is not how many more plastic packages have you sold, but can you find alternative packaging that can be recycled or you know, become part of a closed you know, cycles in, in, in a circular economy and therefore you know, m find different measures of success beyond simply the GDP, the economic measures, which are, or don't measure a success at all, but simply flow through the system regardless of whether it's constructive you know, or destructive. So I think these few comments sort of, sort of get us to be thinking about uh, how uh, we really need to take a systems approach to this idea of success. Uh, recognizing that success is a dynamic process that we're that we're going for, and uh, success is really achieving balance. And of course, this needs to be balanced with the material you know, and the spiritual spiritual together. Uh, and saying, how do we consider success as a set of processes going ahead, where hopefully we will, instead of diverging towards catastrophe, we need to converge towards a more sustainable society, both in material and spiritual terms. So I hope this has stimulated a bit of thinking. I didn't want to talk for too long. We need to leave time for our discussion afterwards. So hopefully this has raised some questions and I'm looking forward to taking the discussion forward. Fantastic. Who wants to go first? I can start. Alex. Nice to see you, Arthur, and thank yeah. you so much for these stimulating thoughts. Uh, I thought about marriage, you know, when you were talking about countries looking for their own interests and if you focus only on yourself in a relationship, probably the marriage won't last or if it lasts, it's not going to be very enjoyable uh, if, you, if you don't have the whole vision in mind. Um, my question would be the following. I w it's maybe playing a bit devil's advocate here, uh, but is, it makes sense, of course, that we need to have this vision of the whole. But my question is, how ready are we to do that in a sense, right? If you think of a company and uh, sometimes they are so desperate into surviving in a short term that they focus on the plastic bag they sell instead of looking at the environmental impact. Because is it not too much in the shoulders of one institution, for example, to be thinking about the whole planet? Or how can we, how we, we can adjust maybe how much we can take in our shoulders to think about humanity as a whole? Or how will you advice to find out the right amount of how much, how big can you care for, in a sense? Say two dimensions to the question. One, of course, is the inertia of the present system and the fact that people trying to compete within the present system are up against enormous constraints, particularly because it's a system that tends towards monopoly domination that escapes from national control, uh, that uh, you know, see fewer and fewer companies buying up more and more of the world's resources of all sorts and uh, you know, sta stamping out everything else. And once in a monopoly position, then they're looking to increase their profits and couldn't care less even about the growth of the economy. Uh, and there are all sorts of risks that are building within the system. So you know, when you're trying to compete within that framework, uh, admittedly, it's very difficult to compete. At the same time, uh, when you have a larger system perspective, but think of the age of the dinosaurs. You've got these enormous you know, reptiles stomping the earth and devouring everything in their path. Squirting in among their feet are these little mammals, you know, little bits like rats and so on and so forth, quite insignificant in the things of their time, but with the ability to control their body temperature, able to innovate 
for changing conditions. And so when, you know, when an asteroid hit the Earth and there was a catastrophe and suddenly the, the dinosaurs couldn't evolve and went extinct, you know, then these little mammals had the ability to innovate and, you know, take over the Earth. So I think part of the challenge for enterprises today is one, not to be stepped on by the big dinosaur, so to speak, by the, the giant one, but also finding niches where they can be creative and innovate and preparing for the new opportunities that will open up as the system evolves and changes. Whether it will evolve you know, gradually or through catastrophes along the way, it's hard to say, but I think you know, anybody at whatever level that is looking in terms of innovation and looking in terms of you know, setting a new set of values and responding to those values and being prepared to, to work within the new values framework, which is the framework that the Baha'i Faith sets out, uh, already will, have, you know, will be ahead of, you know, of, the, of the crowd when the opportunities open up and can really move ahead. So I think that's, that's you know, it's sort of a combination of local and global. And I think each, each at, at their own level, I say, what can we do? Whether it be an individual in their own community, or what can you do my own lifestyle? What can I do to already be, be detached from the overconsumption of society around me and learn to live simply? So if suddenly I'm cut off from other things that won't really matter so much, I'll know, I'll know how, to, how to manage and you know, be prepared the next generation to move forward quickly. Lots of things can be done on the constructive side. So I think the system perspective helps to you know, both acknowledge what is and is not possible because there are obvious constraints we can't do everything, but also identify you know, the ways in which we can move forward and begin to build the new system, even while the old one has not yet collapsed around us. Fantastic, thank you so much. Gary had a point that he would like to share, or yes. question point. Gary. It's basically, I'm sure, nothing new, but essentially, I mean, if we define success, uh, redefine success, I think we're redefining success um, in a different way than what the world, I mean, much of the world today, how it defines success. I mean, when we talk, for example, about the issue of fossil fuel companies that are ex even expanding and not reducing uh, their 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 business activities, which is, as we all know, it's a very much a fact. It's going to create uh, uh, catastrophic issues in the future for for young people. Um, they seem to say success to us, yes, is is, uh, is is basically the ability to operate in this current environment. Whereas there's another group, of course, that's beginning to be young people, maybe maybe the, maybe the group that we're talking with today who sees success as a completely different perspective. Agreed that both sides need to, are looking at it from a systemic point of view, but it seems as if there is a very large uh, uh, difference between um, these two re uh, different definitions of success. And the, always the question that I've had for a long time really is how is there, how can we get over that divide and, and perhaps find success that's being defined in a more holistic way than the way it's being defined in most places around the world. I mean, most of the politicians today are not dealing with many of the very serious questions and only climate change is just one of many. No, I think, you know, we see, and the house also tells us about these forces of disintegration and forces of integration. And, uh, you know, the forces of disintegration are accelerating more and more. And most people, certainly at the political level or in the, the corporate world, are sort of trapped within that system and doing whatever they can to, to profit within the system. But it's a system that is on extremely shaky grounds. In fact, in, the, in the, this meeting I was at on, on complex system science, uh, a lot of them were looking at the, you know, the projections, the, the hyperbolic projections of rising GDP and you know, rising greenhouse gas emissions and so on, heading towards infinity and so on and so forth. But I said, well, you know, much of system science is all about collapse of civilizations and you know, how you have ups and downs. And you know, they were only looking at one side of things, you know, how the bad, you know, so, you know, bad things are, are going, you know, going, accelerating more and more and not acknowledging that at some point there are, there are inevitable controls that come in to you know, bring the system back into balance again. And I think often those are not things that are being considered uh, you know, by those who are you know, simply trapped in the old paradigms. Uh, and yet you know, they're, they're teetering so much you know, more and more that I mean, everybody talks about the next financial crisis, 
because uh, they all say it's, it's inevitable with levels of debt that are accumulating and so on and so forth. It's only a matter of time before something tips things over the edge and things will go plunging. And, and there's also vulnerabilities. As you get more complex systems, you know, they have more inertia, they can also crash much more rapidly as the Soviet system did. And so I think we should not be surprised to see uh, you know, those kinds of, of control, controlling factors coming in and, and, and reining in some of those. So, and that's, in fact, my hope with respect to you know, the immediate future is that we could quickly have a financial crisis. I don't think anything else that would save us from a climate change catastrophe. <clears throat> Something has to slam on the brakes on oil production in Saudi Arabia and gas production in Russia and the business plans of Shell and Total and Exxon and all of these other companies. And I don't see it happening voluntarily. Uh, but something that suddenly meant that you couldn't, didn't have currencies you could trade in and therefore you had a, you know, a complete breakdown in, in, in global trade might be enough to slam on the brakes before we've gone too far towards a climate catastrophe that seems to be on the horizon. So. It's, my hope is that we, we won't see continuing strain of with, without some kind of brakes being slammed on in the immediate future, and that will, you know, the change will come faster than maybe anybody's really expecting at the moment. My question was, I was, you know, your quote or your, when you said, um, how can we be, try to be successful when everybody around us is failing? Um, that, that sparked a thought also around, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I might misquote uh, in, in English here, but I think it was either Shoghi Effendi or Abdul Baha who, who talked about um, truth and, and agreeing on, like being in unity on in agreement allows uh, for truth to emerge. And so that's, I think that's really interesting when you look at, especially a look at, at, at the workplace, you often have teams where kind of uh, one team continues to march on while another team is, is really in, in a bad going through a bad time or something like this, like failing. And so that is, yeah, that was, that was interesting for me to, to kind of think about, um, you know, take, take a broader perspective on success and, and, and also see that, uh, yeah, if, if I am successful, but the rest of, the rest of the people around me is not, that, that's not really successful. So I, I, yeah, that made me think, thanks a lot. Uh, Arthur. Well, I think that it comes with the Baha'i concept of accompaniment. You know, in a complex systems world, individual success counts for very little. But if you can accompany others to be successful, whether it be other parts of the company or other employees you're working with or other people in the community, then you can work on building success together. And it's a, a whole different view, making Celeste a collective thing. And therefore, the fact that anybody is, is, is left behind. I mean, the, the 2030 Agenda Goal is all about leaving no one behind which in a sense means we should be focusing on accompaniment. How do we accompany each other? And how different that is from the spirit of competition in the present business world, where each company is trying to win out over the others. Where if, if, you could, if the oil companies all got together and said, our business plan is rotten, we need to get out of fossil fuel, how do we plan to use our resources to, to, take, you know, to move in a new direction and save our employ employees and so on and so forth? And be, be created. So this is where we we need a whole totally different framework in which we we ask the question and look for solutions as we go ahead. You know, I, I just uh, yeah, really the system approach. I really completely understand and and I'm com completely supportive and, and committed to it. On the other side, as a psychologist, I know how important it is that uh, the experience of being successful. Success is something that makes people happy. Give. Uh, it's good for self-esteem, it's, it's important for the relatives. Um, so we have to find the balance in the approach of the, of, of the concept of success, but really the impact of what the individual, the group, the companies that they are doing, and, and the system approach, I, I, I really say that, that has to, to be in mind of everybody. On the other side, the behavior is driven by some goals that people want to reach and that feeling of success um, that sometimes people are not aware to connect it really to the, the whole system but we should not avoid that approach uh, in the fact that if we make it very big the individual can feel also really yeah, un unable to perform or to do anything and get very sad about it so let's let's have an approach that people 
uh, in their daily life can also have the feeling to be successful. Well, I think that's a wonderful point, and it's one that, that Abdu'l-Bahá makes through divine civilization when he talks about the learned. And you know, he talks about how people who are considered as the learned or knowledgeable in society, you know, they should have comprehensive knowledge about the sciences and the arts and the history of past peoples and all religious books and so on and so forth. And so, but then he says, you know, desire reduced to ashes, uncounted lifetime harvests of the learned. Mm -hmm. And that the only, you know, distinction we should be seeking is spiritual distinction. And therefore, distinction in terms of humility, distinction in terms of, of service and so on and so forth. So I think if we can help people to break out of the, the concept of, of satisfaction in material terms of success, you know, I'm acknowledged, I'm, you know, I'm loved, or, you know, I, I have a place in society, those are parts, but that, you know, in fact, you know, you know, I have been able to be of service, you know, I've tried to acquire spiritual qualities, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, that suddenly, that frees people from trying to meet some of the other standards and therefore feeling depressed. And even, even if you've you know, not had any material success, uh, if you, uh, you feel that in your life you've acquired some spiritual qualities and you've tried to grow and develop spiritually, then that should compensate your, and perhaps replace the other more simple kinds of measures you know, of psychological satisfaction. I think that's where I think the spiritual dimension is so important you know, individually. It's, it's, of course, our challenge is how do you bring that into a corporate structure, an institution, which doesn't have a soul and which doesn't have that spiritual motivation in itself. But I think if, at least at a corporate level, the idea of being of service, you know, is what we're doing as a business of service society, is it helping to, make, to not leave anybody behind, is it helping to meet people's needs, uh, one could one could sort of redefine, you know, you might say an equivalent, you know, spiritual, a set of divine qualities as big, even in a corporate structure that could be taken as measures of success that could, that could be used. And it's very timely because I can see that soul.com has something to say, Mahmoud. Are you going to bring the soul to the conversation? <laughs> uh, I don't know, but, uh, you know, a couple of thoughts came to my mind. First of all, you know, sometimes we we must be clear about our assumptions and uh, some of the assumptions that come up when we talk about the corporate world is that survival in itself is a purpose uh, whereas i'm not sure you know westinghouse disappeared because it had done what it had to do it fulfilled its mission we could say and it uh, did not have a room to exist anymore because in a body cells die all the time and they are replaced by other ones so uh, and i don't say it is not uh, uh, it, it, it is not that uh, the corporate world uh, does not respond to needs all the time but i think uh, we have to clarify assumptions is survival in itself uh, one of the signs of success the second thing is i see that we have 18 brilliant minds around this conversation and maybe we should start coming up with a list of what we believe in this group are actually criteria for success. What is it that we can use as the right criteria for success? For example, fulfilling a purpose. And therefore, then the question will be, how do we define purpose, etc.? But these are concrete things that in uh, Klaus's words, uh, in Wilfried's words, sorry, uh, will actually allow each one of us individually and people around us individually uh, to define it rather than, you know, depending on the huge corporations or governments to intervene in order to redefine it. So, humble suggestion, let's also uh, come up with what we consider a, and a long list if possible so that we can start reflecting on it in the eight months or six months that we have to the conference so that we enrich the conference itself in May uh, by a number of ideas that will have started here. Thank you. Wonderful suggestion. With respect to the, uh, you, know, you might say, sorry, none of us is, as individual human beings, is going to be sustained forever. We all go through a life cycle, we all die off. In a sense, success is really passing on 
values to the next generation, raising and educating children so they can go on and build a better world, uh, fulfilling, you know, acquiring spiritual qualities which we which may continue on in other lives after this life. So in a sense, for human beings, success is trying to pure build some some something spiritual that can that can carry on into the worlds of God. Uh, it's a whole very different definition of success. We can't imagine corporations looking at that kind of success, but it does raise questions about things like what is the optimal size for any activity? We, 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 one of the assumptions is growth, growth in the economy, growth in the company, always getting bigger. But in nature, nothing grows forever. <clears throat> you know, there's an optimal size for each kind of animal. You know, no human being should keep getting more and more obese. You know, and so there's an optimal size for our, our weight and so on and so forth. <clears throat> And therefore, you know, we're really, in terms of the function that's being performed, what is the optimal size in terms, you know, the number of people, you know, the relationships, you know, within the, within the, the organization, uh, and, you know, for how long? I've often thought that government departments and media procedures should all have a sell-by date. You know, they're, they're designed for 10 years, and they will then disappear. If they're missed, then they can be recreated. If not, that's something, there's a process of simplification in the system. So, you know, b actually accepting that things shouldn't last forever and saying they should be a sunset clause for things, you know, or, or time to reflect and renew them should be part, part of our institutional thinking you know, a as well. So I think that, you know, that, those would be some of the elements in terms of coming up new measures of success. When I was a student at University of California, they were trying to decide how big should universities be? What would be the optimal size for a university campus? Of course, in those days, they didn't have the internet. So one measure was, once you had more than 14,000 students, you had to double all the books in the library because single copies weren't enough for everybody able to read them in a reasonable length of time. Or a, 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 an apartment more than, you know, got to be too large a number of faculty that had to break down into subunits. So in terms of human relationships and the dynamics of the university, there were ways of determining optimal size. So one can imagine that corporations as well, you know, Abdul Baha said, that trust would no longer exist in the future. Now, trusts in 1912 were giant corporations in a monopoly position. You know, Standard Oil and so on and so forth, Carnegie Steel. And so you really should be saying, you know, companies shouldn't get to be too big. What would be the optimal size? And then maybe we need many small and medium enterprises that are networking and supporting each other in collaboration and accompanying each other in their success, rather than companies some get bigger and bigger in dominant positions and then, you know, becoming inefficient in their in their large size as we see is often happening today i would also vote for ngos not to be too big and the copper being much smaller so i don't <laughs> think it's surprise the corporates it's just i love the size concept i think that's something we should really cover nushin you had uh, you had your hands up you would like to yes. comment after the question yeah i uh, just uh, uh, refer to what Arthur just said a minute ago that uh, service uh, to humanity is one of the key to feeling successful and uh, the success as Baha'u'llah said that um, work in a spirit of service is uh, uh, equivalent to the worship of god and i must say as an architect 30 years ago i brought the word service to my profession and I advocate that uh, we are supposed to serve humanity through our profession, through art and uh, yet I was nearly going to lose my license because everybody, all the architects in the world jumped on me and say, how do you dare to just bring us down? We are professional, we are not service giver and so on and so forth. And I went on and on and I said, I don't want to be part of this profession if it's not service for humanity. And I went on and on with the fight and eventually nowadays, in many articles, in many dialogue, I hear that we have to service humanity. And I wrote a long time ago that we have to, instead of uh, give award to each other uh, and uh, look for admiration of peers, look for uh, admiration of uh, our client and the public and uh, see how our uh, uh, design reflect uh, their life and uh, uplift their spirit. This is now a very common discussion and 30 years ago was just like a um, taboo to the sense that without exaggeration 
I was uh, uh, threatened by my license. Thank you for that, because I think in the architecture is another area where the question of optimal size needs to be considered. You know, you know, when, you, when you look at some of the giant monuments that have been created in the world, then you look at places like the Shrine of the Bab. You know, right. it's spectacular at a human scale. You know, you right. go to La Défense in Paris, this enormous building, you feel totally, you're like your ants, you're crawling across your, you know, it's, it's, it's what kind of environment are we creating if it makes people feel dwarfed into insignificance as opposed to things that are created you know, at a human scale. So I think even in your own profession, the question of, of optimal size and the human dimension needs to be part you know, of the thinking and not the ego and how impressive or how bigger my will be than somebody else's monument and so on and so forth. So it's a wonderful thing. And I would hope that all of us can be considered, you know, you know, 30 years down the line that we were ahead of our time. You know, that we should, that's what we should be thinking, you know, to help others, you know, way ahead of everybody else and trying to, pay, you know, create a path for others to, to, to find, find their way to something better. Unfortunately, the ego has uh, uh, gone to the point that uh, uh, the architects are creating their own style and the indifference of uh, what that style do to the human spirit or life's living day to day. And uh, for instance, someone like uh, uh, Lipskin, uh, Daniel Lipskin, which I'm sure you know, he used his talent and he became famous with his design in a museum in Berlin, which uh, was a right place to make people sad and uh, emotionally and make them understood uh, about Holocaust. But then he used that as a style for himself and using it in every design, which when you look at it, it just shot into your heart. And mm. it's um, amazing that how bad the modern architecture um, or the famous modernist <laughs> in architecture are ignoring the, um, the spirit of a space and the feeling of the uh, user. But I think we will, time will show successful architecture, unsuccessful architecture from that point of view. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Arthur, for this challenging, interesting discussion. I like the uh, Mahmoud's suggestion of a criteria list. Um, I think that's, that's kind of an interesting challenge for us here today. But getting back to the issue of competition, I mean, maybe it's one of the issues is how do we define competition? Because competition is not always bad, but, you know, the competitive approach that we have, especially in the private sector and the corporate sector, is you know it's not accompaniment it's um it's not wanting to see others very successful so you know how can we look at redefining that whole competitive thing but i wanted to just raise one quick issue with arthur and get your reaction um and it's about the oil and gas industry because you know in canada here right now we're really um suffering our oil and gas industry has been sort of all moved to the us and alberta's you know having a very hard time so there's a big dialogue going on in canada and uh, in fact it's divided the country um you know the oil and gas province of, of canada has said wait a second you know you're not listening to our side of it here we can't just stop oil and gas production so and you know the oil and gas industry i think gets the bad rap of the whole climate change angle and rightfully so but it's pretty hard to just dismiss it immediately and i i don't know you know how we can have a more constructive dialogue around that um, globally, but certainly in Canada, we need it because it's a very, very difficult issue here right now. And, um, you know, I mean, I have family that work and live in the oil industry in Canada, and they're saying, you know, no one understands us. We're in a recession. Everybody's losing jobs. You know, the oil, the oil industry is actually doing something. They are doing research. They are entering into other areas. They're providing a service. You know, if suddenly we didn't have oil and gas, then how are we going to be heating our homes and running our cars and I know people want to change and we do need to change but how, what you know do we talk about transition I just I just wonder about that particular industry because uh, it's you know it's such a it's such a controversial one thanks I think you know it's the same challenge that we face with a whole series of industries I mean, if you imagine from a Baha'i perspective if we get rid of the tobacco industry get rid of the alcohol industry get rid mm -hmm. of luxury goods peace in the world, we don't need the military and the arms industry anymore. That's most of the present economy that has to go. But at the same time, it's like, well, what do we do with the people within those industries? How do we plan for the transition? How do we find 
other jobs for them? How do we acknowledge that the transition is difficult? Not just leaving them, you know, to abandon. I think it's, it's again, it's part of the very individualist approach of the Western economic thinking, each one for themselves, rather than a more collective approach. You know, in Denmark, because they have such good social security, losing jobs is not such a threat. You know that you will, you know, your kids are going to go to school, you're not going to lose your house, there's time to make the adjustment, and so on and so forth. So there's a more collective approach to addressing these issues, acknowledging that they're going to have to be changes, but accompanying people in those changes. Finding, you know, I was asked by some Baha'is to go to Kuwait and speak about climate change, sustainable development to business people in Kuwait. Now, what do you say to the Kuwaitis? Go back to being Bedouins in the desert? <laughs> so there has to be something positive. So I said, well, you have you know, a, a very important asset in, you know, in your country called oil wells. Oil wells are only good for producing oil. They're excellent places for carbon capture and storage. Right. Norway is already using its wells, you're pumping out CO2 to pump out more oil. So could they rethink their industry so they could pay, pump the oil, turn it into hydrogen to sell as a fuel, capture the carbon, putting it back down the wells again? Or grow algae in the Gulf, with direct carbon to the atmosphere, turning it into something they can sell, putting the carbon down the wells, carbon capture and storage. So you know, taking what looks as a liability, turning it into an asset. So I think this is the kind of creative thinking. How do we accompany these industries that have to change to make that change as, as you know, reduce the pain involved in the change, the human dimensions have to be addressed, taking them into account and you know, putting that as part of the solution. Um, Arthur, this also makes me think of, of the innovator's dilemma and I would love to hear your, pers your perspective or the Baha'i perspective on the innovator's dilemma where you know, you're, you're so good in doing one thing like producing oil and, and you need to um, start doing something new and it's very hard to start something new when while you have a, a, a working business model right and this also uh, i was reminded of this when 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 we mentioned that, that architect uh before that did something very successful and from there on all all his works uh kind of tied back to that success and so i think it's very hard to you know kind of rethink success or redefine or reinvent yourself if you still have a, 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 a working, a well working mode of operation. But I think that, again, this is where the spiritual dimension can help. Because if your spiritual perspective is, you know, constant change, nothing stays the same, you need, you're always learning something new, so you're learning, it's saying over again, then you're clearly not learning something, you're repeating the same mistakes over and over again. You know, we go through youth, adulthood, and old age, we have to learn to do things differently. Uh, you know, the Baha'i community itself went through a period of international pioneering and then, you know, the core activities and staying at home. We've also had very significant changes in the whole Baha'i approach down through the decades. So I think to, to accept that change is part of growing and developing and learning new things. And, you know, in a sense, learning even from a young age, we, we need to innovate and be, accept change and rather than clinging to, like, I think the more we have a sense of spiritual security, the more we're free to experiment at other levels. But at the same time, it's where I think we also need the Baha'i concepts of, of solidarity in the community. Look at Abdu'l Baha and the, the village storehouse. If a farmer has a bad year, he doesn't make enough in selling his crop, he receives enough to keep living. And therefore, there, there, there's, there's no sense of being thrown into poverty because there's always a kind of a social backup. You know, people make their best efforts, but you know, beyond that, the society is ready to pick up the slack, so to speak, and to ensure that there's no, no, no suffering in the process of the transition. So you know, I think that by both on individually providing a, a spiritual sense of, of adapting to change and accepting constant innovation, and a community response of acknowledging that in innovation, there are winners and losers, and that the losers have to be helped to adjust and adapt and, and move ahead and find something new and challenge and better for them. I think those are the combination of approaches that may help us to address that kind of a challenge. I think uh, one way of looking at success is at uh, success being the accomplishment of a purpose. Uh, when we have a purpose and we actually accomplish it, uh, it can be called success, then the question is, what is purpose? Uh, if, if I think of the Baha'i community as such, uh, we have an ongoing definition of purpose. It is our plans. Uh, we have 
we have a five-year plan ahead of us. We have a certain number of goals. Success means we have achieved them. And by definition, they change over time. So we don't need to decide that, you know, forever we are going to be doing X and Y. So my suggestion would be uh, success is defined by purpose and purpose can be defined on an ongoing basis based on a conversation as general as possible. Of course, we don't have, the, in businesses, we don't have the advantage of a divinely inspired administration to tell us what our next purpose should be or what our next plan should be. So we're lucky in the Baha'i faith that we have the House of Justice to you know, give us the next steps ahead in that process. But I think there are a number of criteria that, that, that might be useful. Um, certainly, we know that we should be trying to create wealth for everybody. And therefore, wealth creation, as long as it is shared with everyone, is, is, is a desirable purpose. Uh, we know we should also respect the principle of moderation, moderation in all things. Exactly. And therefore, a purpose that carries to excess, that goes beyond moderation, is a distortion of purpose. And so recognizing what is moderation? This is, what is the optimal size? What is the, you know, I think there may be some criteria for <clears throat> defining purpose in particular contexts that we can draw from the different Baha'i principles and the Baha'i writings that would, would help to, in each context, whether it be in a business activity or whatever, you know, finding what would be purpose within that framework and what might be some of the steps to taking it ahead and where one should stop and where we say, we achieve, then we need to go on to another step and, and take another step forward. I would love to hear other others criteria. I, um, as as we as we're our company is starting to talk to investors and defining all of all of the our criteria for moving ahead. Um, things like wealth creation for everyone is is a great uh, measurable. I it's it's measurable. It's it's uh, something that makes sense. Um, and I'm sort of looking for things like that, things that are not just um, qualitative, but, but uh, very solid things that we can, we can put down that we, we can measure. And I want to invite also to have a discussion on the individual and on the, the daily life and uh, make sure that we, if we define something as what we want to do or reach or that that it's of course it's connected to the to, to the purpose goals we, we 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 define in the broad way, but every individual when he wakes up in the morning and say, I really like to do this, make a nice meal for the homeless people, and if they enjoy the meal, that gives me a feeling of success. We do have the standard development goals, which were the the, the government's attempt to the United Nations to define what would sustainable be: eliminating poverty, eliminating hunger whether it be simply feeding the people in your neighborhood who don't have enough to eat. I mean, as you, you, yeah. you said, you, you, this can be taken at various levels. In fact, we actually had a, I have a conference in, in Bolivia translating the standard of levels down to the individual level. What are the things in those goals that each person could do for themselves in their own family, in their own community? And so, and all of that, you know, progress in any of those is an, an, a way of moving towards one element of success, part of that larger picture of sustainability. There are many bits and pieces and it all needs to fit together. And each one can find in their own particular context, which ones are relevant and you know, can, can help to take them forward. And if you're meeting somebody's basic needs or helping society you know, address a challenge or go in a new direction, all of that can be part of success. Yeah. And Mary and, uh, and Clark, I was wondering what a, what a successful uh, movie or documentary looks like in your eyes. I actually had a different thought. I, I don't know if it's useful, but, you know, Baha'u'llah says that he likes a face uh, wreathed in smiles, which in, indicates uh, a degree of contentment. And I think success is when, when we are empowered by a degree of contentment in our own lives. Um, because it's difficult if we're full of anxiety and so on. It, it's kind of a way to, to feel more content in our own situations, to understand that it's going to be okay. Uh, there's so much anxiety about climate change and so on, and there needs to, you know, this is, this is what God has really given to us. But, but we also can be sure that the earth is going to be crisp. We're, we're just all, <laughs> we're going to be okay. We just need to work just our way through A little sunburned. A little sunburned. I think, you know, 
Baha'u'llah came with a message for all humanity. We didn't listen. We had two world wars. We still didn't listen. Now the planet is telling us we'd better listen. <laughs> and you know, he's, he's trying different ways to convince us that there's only one solution to these problems. And that is the, that is the Baha'i solution. <laughs> and you know, climate change, because it's global, is saying you must unite. You must have unity. You must work at the global level. Nothing other than world unity will address this problem. Another criterion, perhaps, is in the system's perspective, those things that lead to increased connections in the system, more interactions. So systems become more stable. The more they have diversity, the more they have cooperation and reciprocity, the more highly integrated they are, uh, in a sense, the more they become productive. You know, that's, you know, coral reefs are fantastic for that because there are thousands of species all collaborating together in, in many different ways. So anything that contributes towards more unity and diversity in the Baha'i perspective, more connections, you know, more enrichment, you know, that might be another you know, systems definition of something that is contributing to success of the overall system by enriching it and you know, building more stability into it or helping it be more productive and more efficient. Mm -hmm.